Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to the program. Our topic today is so cutting edge that it will be new information to most of our listeners. We will be talking about transformational festivals, celebrations that are causing a spiritual evolutionary trend, a movement so powerful that it is literally changing our culture, worldview, and how we do church. The truth is, this global phenomena is growing in numbers and popularity and the mainstream media has not even noticed, nor are most pastors warning their congregations about them. That's why we are covering this topic on this show. Our guest today is Carl Tykrib, expert on the subject of transformational festivals and chief editor of Forcing Change Monthly Journal. Welcome, Carl Tykrib. Well, thanks, Cindy. It's good to be on the program with you. Great. Now, Carl, before we begin on the topic, can you share with us information about yourself and Forcing Change, your monthly journal? Absolutely. I've been doing this type of research, research into the area of how, uh, how our world is changing in terms of globalization, the idea of, of coming together as a collective, mankind's power through our unity, how, and how this looks politically, how it plays out in the sphere of economics, religion, and even the cultural side, which is the expression of transformational festivals as that cultural component of, of mankind creating and charting a brand new path. And so our job here with Forcing Change has been very much to document and analyze the push towards internationalism, oneism, and how that impacts and affects Christianity and uh, families, businesses, right down to the local level, to the individual. Because if oneism as a worldview is the, the overriding principle that the world is running on, well, then it will impact every facet of existence. And indeed, it does. And today we're seeing this being played out, even culturally, mm -hmm. through things like the festivals we'll be talking about. And Forcing Change is our monthly publication that documents and details these developments. Mm. And we will give our audience info at the end of the show, Carl, as to how to become a member of Forcing Change. You know, I have learned personally a lot from your volumes, and there's a wealth of information, uh, and we will be giving you that information at, towards more at the end of the show. Um, I have learned a lot about the transformational festivals by reading your vol volumes and your journals. Uh, but right now, Carl, can you give us a few facts and information about these transformational festivals? Well, certainly. What's interesting is, is these are not localized phenomena. This is not just simply one festival or, or one gathering popping up here and there. It is a globally, uh, globally charged festival culture. There are events literally around the world. They are growing. And I gave a presentation this spring where I suggested about 120 to 150 uh, significant festivals uh, of this type are now uh, annually taking place. Cindy, I was so wrong, mm. so wrong. There are upwards of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds mm. of festivals, uh, potentially up to a thousand. I've been slowly documenting and working through uh, where they take place and, and, and what's all happening at these different events. And it is just mind-blowing how many are taking place. Even just in your part of the world, in, in the, along the eastern seaboard of the U.S., it is awash, it is saturated with mm. a multitude of, of transformational festivals and events. I say events because there are festival-type events taking place, more like conferences, that definitely bring about the idea of transformation, oneness, and, uh, and that what we're doing is looking for a different reality, a new worldview, a new paradigm to set our existence into. And so when you take a look at these events, which, which you're seeing typically are young people uh, going to these, though it is open to all age groups, uh, these, these events are being held uh, usually in more remote, natural settings, uh, in the hills, along beaches, 
right now as we speak, Burning Man is taking place, and that happens in the northern de- uh, deserts of Nevada. Usually in, in, in places that will, that will bring you into tune with your natural setting around you, and reinforcing the idea that you are part of the natural, uh, natural landscape, you're part of the natural existence. And, and the, the gamut of, of who goes is wide. Like I said, a lot of young people, but also older individuals, too. And some of these events are, are absolutely enormous. Like right now, Burning Man, mm-hmm. uh, upwards of 70,000 people wow. are participating. Wow. And then, you have, and then you have many smaller ones that only bring together uh, 1,000, 1,500, or sometimes as low as, as five to 200 people. But they still have an impact on, on, on the people who attend. Mm. And and why so much interest in these festivals? I mean, I remember speaking to you in our last conversation, Carl, and you said in your research, when you started looking up on the map, how many there were, not only in my area, which is the Philadelphia, PA, New Jersey area, but all over the United States and the globe, you said that you were putting little pins on the map and all those little mm. pins were gathering together and they were so close and that you realized how many there were. Uh, it's amazing that we have... Uh, globally, this uh, this huge amount of festivals happening in all these areas. Now, how many people did you say attended? Again, there could be as little as four thousand. I think the last time we spoke, you said up to four hundred thousand. Is that correct? Well, yes. There's one that that takes place in Hungary, known as, as the Zaget Festival, mm-hmm. which is predominantly a uh, a music-based festival, but it has transformational elements in it. Um, workshops on yoga, mm-hmm. on Reiki healing, on sacred spaces. So it brings together more than just simply music, and that's important for people to realize. There is a difference between simply going to a concert, going to a party. We've always had parties. We've always mm-hmm. had concerts. We've always had music and dance. There's something different going to a transformational festival or transformational event, and that is that it incorporates those elements, certainly, but then it brings in other areas that help to expand your consciousness, expand your awareness, uh, change your worldview, change your perception of reality. And so you have workshops, you have yoga, you have sacred spaces, you have even temples that are erected. Right now, Burning Man has a temple that, that's, that's sitting out in the desert right now that people are going to. Um, so events like the one that in Hungary is to get uh, brought together about 390,000 people. Wow. That, that's a city in itself, a massive city in itself, uh, as they participate for a multi-day music and awareness uh, festival that goes far beyond just simply listening to music, dancing, and partying. There is a, a transformational element to it that's been put in there by the organizers. And so that's important for people to realize this is not just simply a concert, not just simply a party, but that there is an intention, an, an intentionality behind it. And that intentionality is to change and challenge your worldview, to look at reality in a different way. And so it offers the tools to do so. Now, we know that there is um, a transformational type of, like you were just saying, worldview behind all this. But up front, you know, if one was to see one of these festivals, what they are seeing, what is the interest? If they knew nothing about the intent behind it, you see a community, a village, a place to get away from the norm. You know, what what is the interest, like I had had mentioned before, what is the enticement with these festivals? What's bringing people together? Oh, Cindy, high energy, mm-hmm. uh, an, intense, an intense experience, working together as a community because these are, are participatory driven. You, you involve yourself. But we live in a day and age when, face it, most of us just go to work, mm-hmm. go home, sleep, eat, go to work. And so there's a mundane aspect of, of living. And these festivals look to transcend that mundane aspect to say, oh, there's a whole new reality. Let's experience something ecstatic, something beyond the norm. And so that itself becomes a, a real driving force where people now say, there is a new reality. I'm going to plug into that because it is enticing. It is exciting. So a, a big part of what, what you see here is that there is an energetic drive towards experiencing something unique, something that will change 
your way of looking at the reality and looking at the world around you. And so oftentimes, when you take a look at, at what people say about these events, they'll say things like, it totally changed my life. Mm. Uh, my life was going one direction, and I made a 180-degree turn after attending this particular festival. Uh, I had a, a conversion experience. I will never see life the same again. And so even the organizers recognize that, that oftentimes people will come just for the music, they'll come for the party, they come for the dance, and at the same time they're offering them this smorgasbord of transformational elements, transformational workshops, lectures, sacred spaces, uh, group ceremonies, rituals. Mm. They're basically, it's basically producing a new narrative something far beyond just simply going to work or going to school, going home, repeat, repeat, repeat. And so that, that itself is enticing. I look at that and I go, wow, you know, that's exciting. Going to these events, there's a tremendous amount of excitement, a tremendous amount of energy, and a lot of, a lot of openness. So it's very uh, it's geared very much towards let's, let's be um, open, radical tolerance, no judgmentalism, all of these things become very appealing because then you can literally let yourself go and live out uh, your innermost uh, aspirations and imaginations and be able to do it in a, in a place that everybody accepts it because this is now part of you experiencing your new, your new reality. And there's so many ages involved. I noticed that there were oh, yeah. many ages. When I looked at the festivals online, you see 70, 80-year-olds dancing around. I remember listening to a very young girl, and she said, uh, I, believe it was, I believe it was at the Lightning in a Bottle Festival, saying, if the whole world would be like this, it would be a happier world to live in. And just right. to think that that very young girl, she sounded like seven years old, was thinking about a future reality, something different that she, she knows right now. You know, and exactly. most likely and, you know, we have... It, um, it, oh, it, go ahead, Carl. Oh, I just, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and it's colorful. It's exciting. It's vibrant. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's life. There's, there, it's pulsing with, with people doing things and interacting together. And, and so, we're going on a break, Carl, so we're going to hold that. Oh, it's oh. vibrant. It's colorful. It's enticing. We'll be talking about that right after the break. We'll be right back. Don't touch that dial. Don't touch your mouse. If you're a first-time listener, you'll find that on Love for the Truth Radio, we discuss news and views through a biblical worldview. We believe that the Bible is the inherent Word of God and the absolute truth that should be applied to every aspect of life. We don't proclaim to have a cap on the truth, but we do have a love for biblical truth. So please take everything you hear on this radio show to study and prayer. And thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Evolve Fest is the perfect venue for us to come and do our thing and really connect with people. What we really are is just a group of friends with a vision in mind, and that vision is to spread peace, love, and happiness, and spiritual awareness, and create an environment for people to really discover who they are inside. And we encourage everyone to come, join us, and just be you. Stimulating activity that you can bring home with you. For instance, um, there's yoga going on in the morning, and it was like a really good yoga session. I feel like I'm gonna go home and be practicing those yoga moves. And I, uh, I met this guy who uh, he made these like pendulums of chakras, and I ended up picking one up because it really reverberated me. And I want to go home and try to make those. Like that was so beautiful. I was inspired. We have a band that was playing on the stage earlier. They're coming to our tent later, and we're gonna try to have them like loop sounds while we gong people out, and we're gonna mix the new age sound with the old age sound, and really just sandwich you in to see if we can propel you into a new state of enlightenment. And like everyone's just trying to be like interactive and experimenting and like making this the most beautiful environment possible. And like that's what it's about, you know, like just like trying to create beauty together. And like that's why I love Evolve. 
If you just tuned in, you're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host. We're talking about transformational festivals with our guest and expert, Carl Tycrib. Carl is the chief editor of Forcing Change, a monthly journal that includes a wealth of resources on many topics. And at the end of the show, we will give you information as how to get in touch with Carl and become a member of Forcing Change. On our break, we played a soundbite of a participant from Evolve Fest 2013. Evolve Fest was uh, located right near the PA, Philadelphia PA area, basically in our back door. Um, The young man expressed his excitement and he said, we do our thing here. We connect. There's a vision of peace, love, and happiness. There's spiritual awareness to discover uh, inside yourself. There's stimulating activity and yoga. He seems so excited that he wants to bring the experience home. He's going to invite one of the bands to his hometown to share the new reality that he has found. And uh, this is what we're talking about today. They're not only a music, dance, arts festival that's being held in these places globally, Globally, but they're also a transformational type of phenomenon that's happening in the lives of people. I'd like to uh, journey you through one of these festivals to find out what the big deal is or why are these festivals a global phenomenon? In other words, what's the enticement? Um, Carl, you're there on the line. Yes. Now, what was wild, Cindy, was just listening to the excitement in that, in that young man's voice. He's pumped. He's converted. He's giving, I mean, he's found something that he can grab hold of. And as we were talking about before the break, these are colorful. These are ecstatic. These are exciting. These are events that bring together a lot of energy, a lot of emotion, and a lot of experience. Mm. Now, I know there's music, there's movement, there's dance, there's art, creative interaction. Uh, let's take a tour, Carl. If you were to take me through one of these uh festivals what would we see well you're going to see a lot of you're going to see a lot of smiling faces you're going to see a mm-hmm. lot of people just excited to be there there's there's a, a definite build up of excitement as the event begins as the lineups are 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 growing to get into the event even even with what we're seeing here at burning man at the burning man festival is taking place right now i was watching and, and kind of uh, keeping tabs on on the opening of the event and the car lineup was incredible as people were jammed and excited and ready to get into this event. So you're going to see just a lot of that enthusiasm build up as they go into this. Then you're going to notice that there is a lot of color, there's a lot of costuming. Uh, there there are people all around you who are who are uh, excited to be there. Uh, I know of uh, one particular festi- festival in uh, southern Tennessee that brings together about 90,000 people, mm. Bonnaroo, and, and participants talk about how they'll go into it, and strangers are giving them hugs, and there's high fives, and there's this feeling of acceptance, mm. and everybody is, is anticipating what they will experience together, this journey now that, that will take place that combines sound, workshops, dance, yoga, things like Evolve Fest, shamanistic experiences, uh, kundalini yoga, altered states of consciousness. Even in a bowl fest, you'll have a temple set up. It's called the Ascension Temple. Mm. Uh, there's about 60 workshops at a bowl fest that bring in things like global sh- paradigm shifts, uh, reiki, healing stations, drumming circles, a lot of interactive art. So you can watch artists as they engage in painting and sculpting and crafting and, and and be able to interact with them. And it's considered visionary art, Cindy, because mm. they are expressing a vision of what tomorrow should look like in their worldview through their art, uh, which is typically built around the idea of, of raising their consciousness, expanding themselves, a what we would call a new age way of looking at reality. And, and that's so this exactly is the kind of, a kind of excitement that builds into it and, and the things that you see. And, of course, the night comes alive with music. And some of the, some of the events, uh, like a boom in Europe, it is literally day in, day out, uh, electronic dance music, 24 hours a day, nonstop. Uh, I was reading one particular individual who had, had attended boom, and he said he does, didn't even like trance dance music. But he found himself inevitably dancing to it after about 24 hours because it just pulsated continuously. So there was this, this amazing 
buildup that, that you are a part of, uh, and it's considered ecstatic, and that's what it is. And so this is why it's drawing so many people in. It's, it's a very exciting, very alluring, very attractive way of literally celebrating and celebrating something. They are celebrating something, and that's the important part. Whether they know it or not, the organizers understand it, and that's the important part. Whether the participants know it or not, they are celebrating something. And mm. so that's why they're there. Yeah, and you know, I read on a website that says experience, expression, where boundaries melt, creativity right. breaks out, full express body and soul, let go, find yourself, be yourself, be creative, be a part of a culture, a tribe, a community. And you mentioned dance, and I remember, Carl, looking at uh, some of the information that you had given me, and it seemed that these were uh, these festivals were built like cities, and surrounding a main stage or a platform where dance seems to be the uh, focus of worship, and I believe they call it uh, trance dance. Do you find that the dance part of it and the music seems to be the pulse of these uh, oh, festivals? Absolutely. Uh, it's very much uh, almost, you, you could look at it as the backbone mm. uh, to the skeletal structure of the festival. It, it is the drawing card. It was, it's what brings people in. It, what, it's what keeps the energy going. It, it's, it's what keeps the excitement moving. And so things like, like Burning Man isn't necessarily music driven in fact it was simply it started off back in 86 as burning an effigy on the beach uh then the, in the early and mid 90s became just basically a bohemian run around out in the desert uh shoot up stuff um lots of drugs lots of alcohol lots of sex lots of just craziness mm. and then burning man ended up uh, with a a musical component and an artistic component that kind of came along into it and so today, you can go to things like Burning Man, and yes, you can go do the trance dance, uh, have that experiment, experience as well. It's a part of it. And it's interesting because the trance community, the electronic dance community, recognizes that there is a, a unifying element when everybody comes together and has this joint experience of ecstatic movement uh, as, as your body all becomes one in rhythm and in intent to celebrate through the music. And uh, it's kind of funny because I've, I've listened to some, some uh, interviews where they're, they're going, well, you know, if you just want to dance alone in your bedroom, this isn't going to do it for you. Right. You've got to come out here and experience it full on with this group. It is a group dynamic. And that's what the dance does. That's what the music does. It coalesces that group around a, a skeletal structure. It creates that backbone structure upon which everything else kind of hangs. Mm -hmm. Not all transformational festivals are like that. Some of them, some of them have yoga as the primary structure upon which the rest of the fruit kind of hangs off of it. Uh, Wonderlust festivals are primarily yoga-driven. Um, Evolve Fest is considered to be one of the top ten yoga festivals uh, in the country, potentially internationally. Um, so sometimes the music side of it is, is a secondary thing. If it's, let, let's say, a yoga-driven festival like Bhakti Fest or uh, some of the other yoga festivals that are taking place, but the music side for many of the transformational festivals is that drawing card. It seems like there's maybe one thing, like you said, the trance dance, or it's yoga, or it's uh, some kind of healing. It's just one thing that just seems to be one of the main focus that actually ushers in that transformational experience. But there right, seems to right. be some kind and, of and focus that's why, there. And that's why people are going, mm -hmm. because they want to, they want to, they, they gravitate to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, Carl, you know, if I was, uh, if I had teenagers, mine are grown now, you know, the first thing that I would think of, oh, okay, there's music, there's dance, all right, there's other things like yoga, but they don't have to participate in that. It just seems so innocent. You know, um, I've heard some of them online that said, hey, we don't do any drugs here. You know, everything is just all, we, we want to just feel the land, be natural, eat good foods, you know. And so a parent might even say, uh, gee, my kid's in a safe place. They all love one another. They're a community. They're going to take care of one another. Uh, why not let them go and just tell them? not to interact in, in, in any of these uh, other things like yoga or whatever. Is that possible? Or does it draw you right into the intent that these, uh, these festivals have? 
It is possible, but uh, it's not necessarily something that you would recommend. I, I was talking to, mm-hmm. to one lady who was a participant in some festivals this summer. I did a, a presentation on this, this development, mm-hmm. and this lady come, came to me later, and she said, you're right, you're right that this is about a worldview of oneness, mm-hmm. about world unity, bringing us in all together for this ec- ecstatic experience where we feel like we're all one. She wasn't there for the yoga. She wasn't there for, for really anything else except simply to party and hang with her friends. But she did recognize that, indeed, mm-hmm. while there may be people going there who, who may simply only be there for the party um, and for you know, the good times, she recognized, though, that that worldview is ex- incredibly enticing. And whether you realize it or recognize it or not, your 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 own experience is now coming in line with the experience that they're trying to give you, that experience that you are now connected, that you're one, that you're all part of this cosmic consciousness, this unity of humanity, nature, divinity, which comes out over and over again as the intent for these events, literally a celebration of those, of that pr- particular principle. Mm. And, and it so, seems like I, you know, Cindy, I know, I know parents who've had their, their youth go there mm-hmm. and in tears tell me that, that this is the worldview that they've accepted, that they have, they have dropped Christianity, they have mm-hmm. dropped the faith of their fathers, they have dropped uh, Jesus Christ, and now they are now living a different reality, one that says man, nature, and deity are one. You know, in, in my research, these festivals uh, do seem to be very similar in nature. It's that community, that connecting, that coming together. It seems that, Carl, uh, we find today that even in the church, there's that real hunger, that real need to find something that uh, that you can connect with, a community that you can feel safe in. Um, G. Kai Lung, he's the advocate for uh, transformational festivals worldwide, says that these festivals have never been branded. And that's very interesting because there are many different ones. They all have different names. However, there are distinct subcultures that are forming, and they're calling themselves burners, tribals, side trancers, which tells me that these people, young or old, are finding identity in these subcultures of some kind. And yet, would you say that burners, tribals, side trancers, whatever they call themselves, are all coming to a, a one point, like you said, almost to this community, this worldview, this oneness. It, they all seem to point into that direction. Is that correct? Oh, there's no question about that. And that is recognized within the transformational community. Mm-hmm. They realize that while there will be a numerous and, uh, and very diverse ways of expressing it, diverse ways of celebrating oneness, that that concept nevertheless remains the core principle. And so that's why you have things like um, Tomorrowland out of Belgium, which this year ran for two weekends in a row and brought together approximately 320,000 youth. Massive, a massive a musical celebration and festival. And Carl, we're going complete. on a break in about just a few seconds. Uh, we'll All continue right. this conversation, but these festivals seem like a safe place, but there's another side to them that's not so safe. There's a religious side and what participants refer to as sacred space. Many would agree that we are living in unprecedented times. Grave immorality is on the rise, as in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. There are wars and rumors of wars as nations rise against nations. Prophecy is being fulfilled as the birth pangs become quicker and harder. These are the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. There is one sign often left untaught. Jesus also told the disciples in the Olivet Discourse to take heed that no man deceive you. This warning applies to us too. Deception has infiltrated the churches through many false teachings and movements, making apostasy paramount. As contenders of the faith, we do our best to research and discuss these false teachings for you, the listener. Thank you for having a love for the truth. But the thing that makes us stop and take a deep breath is that we notice that it's not all just art for art's sake. There's this whole sacred stream. There's altars everywhere, at every stage. Sometimes there's even full-on temples. And there's people gathered, holding sacred space 
in circles and ceremonies, not under the flag of one religion or spiritual stream, but something more direct and unmediated. No less profound is this emergence of a new type of spiritual culture in these festivals, a spiritual culture completely uninterested in charismatic leaders, dogmas, or doctrine, where ritual does not require that we surrender our autonomy as critical thinking individuals, but instead arises as the shared acknowledgement and honoring of our sacred experience together. If you just tuned in, you're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host. With me is Carl Tykrib, Chief Editor of Force and Change. We've been talking about transformational festivals, a phenomena that is sweeping the globe, causing a new paradigm, a new reality, a change in our culture, church, and worldview, and no one seems to notice, not even the mainstream media. In this segment, we'll be covering the spiritual part of these transformational festivals. We just heard a soundbite of Jeet Kai Lung, advocate for these festivals worldwide, and he says this emergent spiritual culture is completely uninterested is in charis charisma, charismatic leaders, dogma, or doctrine. In short, he goes on to say they are more interested in the experience. They evoke the sacred together through prayer performances, share monies, group encounters, infusing sacred consciousness with a new creative juice. Uh, there seems to be this common connection here, Carl, that we were talking about, <clears throat> all pointing to this one transformational intent this one worldview influence. Um, can you walk us through the spiritual part, the practices, the sacred spaces, and so forth? Well, what it boils down to, Cindy, is that the experience is what drives this movement towards having a new idea of divinity, a new idea of being at one. And, and what happens, regardless of what what type of conference, or, or not conference, but transformational festival it is, whether it's a, a full-on transformational festival like a Vol Fest, uh, one that's more experiential in a big, big scale that, that sometimes is quite disjointed like Burning Man, or whether it's Tomorrowland, which is just a, a flat-out a music festival, but yet the organizers infuse the entire thing with a mystical element that you are all one, we're all connected, Regardless of all, you know, all the various and, and, and incredibly subtle varieties of these festivals that are out there, and there's so many of them, they all speak to the idea that what we're doing is awakening your divinity. We're awakening that realization that you, as part of the human family, as part of the cosmic family, that you, that nature, that God, that energy, that the cosmos are all one. There is no separating factor whatsoever between yourself and nature, between nature and God, between God and energy. And now that's infused within your experience, and you feel it. You participate in that energy. You participate in that flow. And so this is the worldview that's coming through. It really, Cindy, what it boils down to mm. is the same worldview that all the ancient myths have held to, mm. that all the new myths, the new pagan myths that we're, that we're birthing hold to, and it is the essence of the pagan ideal of oneism, that everything is one. We're all interconnected. So in reality, there is no good. There is no bad. There is no light. There is no darkness. It's all one. It's all together. And this is what comes out over and over again. What we're seeing is a Hinduization of mm. the Western world where we are now accepting that Hindu worldview that we are all on, this, all on this journey, this cycle, this wheel of life, birth, death, rebirth, and we're all moving towards this collective one. Mm. Yeah, and you know, the first thing I saw, and I don't know much about Hindu worship or Hinduism, but um, I did notice right away the New Age practices, you know, just ex yeah. worshiping the earth and getting, in, like you said, in touch with the cosmos and uh, being one. But it just seems that, you know, uh, we had this discussion about postmodernism. Um, we're leaving almost the postmodern thought. That's been around for how many years, did you say, about 30 yeah, 30 to 40 years, I, we could say that we've been in the era of postmodernism, where postmodernism is, as you could call it, the dominant framework, that dominant uh, way of looking at the world. And postmodernism, postmodernism 
in, in, at its core, says that everything is relative. There is no truth. Uh, there's really nothing that you even can hang uh, hang yourself on You're, in terms of a worldview. You can't really hang uh, your, your your beliefs on a particular hook because mm-hmm. in postmodernism, it's all up for questioning. It's all up for for uh, for criticism. Uh, it, it's experiential based. All of that is there in postmodernism, but you know we've we've entered what I believe to be a new era. Mm-hmm. And I believe the the footprints of this were already visible about ten, fifteen years ago, and this is what the transformational community calls reenchantment. I mm-hmm. call it paganism in toto, the Latin concept of complete, final, absolutely saturated in, and it is again that worldview of oneism that we are all one, we're all connected, we're all unified. And which, interestingly, is one of the titles of one of the transformational festivals called Unify. Mm-hmm. Um, so this worldview is, is what is, is uh, the dominant factor of not just simply these festivals, but of society in general. And the reason I'm saying that is these festivals consider themselves a mirror of where society already is today. Mm-hmm. And that's so important, because what that means, Cindy is that while your children may not be running off to these festivals, while your neighbors or coworkers might not be running off to these festivals, mm-hmm. odds are really high that they already accept at least some of the worldview that we've been talking about, mm-hmm. that man, nature, and God are one, and that the world must unify and express that. All these festivals are is a celebration of the fact that as a society, we've already achieved this worldview in a very dominant way. And it's there. It's just now starting to really bubble to the surface. It's what some of my friends from the 1960s, as I was explaining this to them, said to me this spring. They said, you know, the seeds that we planted back in the 60s and early 70s through the hippie movement, what the seeds that we planted back then are now finally beginning to see mm. real growth. Wow. Yeah, and it just seems that the postmodernism thought made a segue or ushered in this all becoming one right now. You know, let's get back to the practices that we're going to see at these festivals. We've got the temples, the sacred spaces, the prayer formances, the circles, the mantras. You know, I noticed, too, that there was a lot of fire and drums and dance. It seems that there is uh, not only the concept of oneness, oneism, but there's a an evident of worship through right. these mantras, through the drum beats, uh, through the dance, you know, the sacred spaces. And um, as you were saying before, some of them have temples. Some of them have, uh, I, I believe I saw one burning down temple or a temple at the end of the event. Can you explain why they have these, uh, these type of, um, I guess it, what you would call it, a, a symbol? whether it's burning man with burning the man or a temple burning the temple. Well, you know, what it boils down to is, is we are inherently religious in nature. Mm-hmm. And so this is why postmodernism, which is really about not really grabbing hold of anything, is now changing where society is now grabbing a new religion. And this mm-hmm. is why it's no longer simply postmodernism, uh, kind of a society in flux. This is now society with intention, mm-hmm. with a recognition mm-hmm. of a new worldview, one that they are hanging their hook on. And that is now being expressed also through a very religious side, the sacred spaces, the temples, the shrines that are set up at these different, at these different events. And, and so you'll have things like, uh, probably the best example is the big, the big temple being built at Burning Man. At the end of the week, at the end of Burning Man, where you have 70,000 people partying and celebrating and, and just doing lots of crazy stuff, lots of energy, lots of color, lots of life, lots of incredible art, at the end of it, they'll burn down a 40-foot-high human effigy. And I've watched the live feeds uh, of the event for a few years already. I have friends who go. I have friends who they're witnessing right now. And what's, what's interesting is the dynamic around the burn of the man. It's exciting. Uh, it is loud. There's lots of fireworks. It is. It has that real party intensity. Ironically, the next night that's that's coming up this coming Saturday. The next night, the Sunday is is when they burn the temple, and they have a big, beautiful temple that they'll erect. And all week long, people are pouring their emotions into it, mm. writing down their feelings on cards or notes, 
pasting up pictures of, lo- of loved ones who have passed away or loved ones that they have, have some concern over. It's a place of meditation. It's a place of quiet and solitude. It's a place of, of, of sacredness. That's mm. the idea behind it. They burn that the next day. And the, the environment of, of that burn is very different. Whereas when they burn the effigy, it's exciting and rah, rah, rah. When they burn the temple, it's dead quiet. Mm. It's silence as they all sit in reverence, reverence, watching this go in flames. That's interesting. And I, I did read that basically the big word or the buzzword was grief. They're releasing their grief, whatever that is, and that right. covered everything. So if you can release right. your grief, you can get healed, and when you leave this place, you're transformed. That's basically what it seems you know, seems to happen there. So we're starting to see that, indeed, there is a transformation that's taking place, not only in the concept of the festival itself and how it's bringing forth these New Age Hinduism practices, this one oneism, but it's also, uh, there's also transformation happening in the individual that will last a lifetime. And I think that's uh, what we really need to take a look at. And we're going to be covering that in the last segment, you know, uh, how it's even coming into our churches. But I, I think what's just so interesting here is these are not just makeshift kind of festivals. You had mentioned that these are cities. These are places where they have, uh, you know, uh, planes flying in and they have uh, health facilities facilities erected and can you tell us a little bit about that that they're well managed they're well managed and so that there's you know the the community has nothing against these festivals they leave they take everything with them you know leaving a beautiful spotless area Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how massive these things are and how well administered how well constructed they are well, and that's important for people to realize. This mm-hmm. is not just simply um, hodgepodge, makeshift, throw everything up and, mm-hmm. and with, with no organization to it. Uh, some of them started off like that. Burning Man started off like that. But now Burning Man is literally a constructed, organized city with streets, with grid layouts. Uh, it has its own little airport. For the time that, that Burning Man is in effect, uh, and a city that's constructed around it, a city of 70,000 people. This is not a small town. This is a city. Uh, it even has its own zip code for that time period. Uh, it has a, a very, wow. very uh, important police presence that is a part of it already. Health stations. Uh, you, know, you have to be able to cater to a lot of needs when you have 70,000 people mm, because absolutely. things can happen. In fact, this time, I believe it was today, there was a lady who, who was accidentally drove over and killed by one of the art cars. Um, oh. So there are things that happen. Uh, and some of these, some of these festivals uh, that are a little smaller, like a Vol Fest with only 2,000 people coming per day, it's, it's more intimate. It doesn't have the grandeur the way that Burning Man has or some of these other ones. But nonetheless, it is still very organized. It's very scheduled, uh, and it has to be. If you're bringing together people of that of that magnitude, there has to be some structure that goes with it. There's a lot of planning. There's a lot of a lot of, of networking that takes place. Mm-hmm. And so, and we, so what we see is a, a you know an organized situation where the community would honor it coming into their their space. There, we're going in on a break. Um, These festivals are massive, expansive trend that seeks to birth a new world emergent spirituality, and that's what we're going to talk about when we come right back, so stay tuned. So then, Joseph and his colorful coat flew up into the starry sky. With each new generation, stories from the Bible captivate our imagination and inspire our hearts. There is a place where inspiration and imagination come to life. For over 35 years, Sight and Sound Theaters has been transporting audiences back in time. Unlock your imagination and join us at Sight and Sound Theaters, where the Bible comes to life. Questions. There's a lot of those flying around, and chances are you've got a few of your own. 
To make things worse, it seems you can't make a move without bumping into others with the same questions. In this scientific age that supposedly disproved the Bible, it's hard to know what to believe. Wouldn't it be nice if you could find solid scientific and biblical answers? That's exactly what you can expect from Answers in Genesis. Not only that, we have something for everyone, from kids to adults. Whether it's conferences, the website, radio, books, DVDs, curriculum, or the Answers magazine, the goal remains the same, to give you answers from the Bible and science beginning in Genesis. As a matter of fact, we're so dedicated to these answers, we built a 70,000 square foot creation museum to point you in one direction to show why the Bible's history and gospel based in that history is true. The Bible's history will come to life as you encounter 160 exhibits, theaters, and a breathtaking planetarium. So, if you find yourself searching for answers in today's skeptical world, check us out and prepare to believe. It is so hard to believe that I'm actually here at the Green Belt Festival in Cheltenham, England. It's been months upon months planning this moderator's pilgrimage of bringing together a hundred United Church ministry leaders from all across the country. Half of them under the age of 40, half of them over the age of 40. Idealism, energy, experience, and wisdom. And we have now arrived at this four-day festival festival where 20,000 people or more have gathered together here at the racetrack of all places to explore new ways of being church. We couldn't stand the old-fashioned language and what we wanted was a language that was relevant (laughs) more than anything else. We wanted to be relevant in the world. A, A lot of people in my generation, we've been on a journey to follow Jesus and justice. And it's getting us into more and more trouble. Our mothers are worried about us. They're worried we're going to hell. Our, our old Sunday school teachers and youth group leaders are worried about us. Uh, and they keep asking us questions and we don't even remember how to answer those questions because it's not the way we think anymore. And then he said, um, here's what he said. We need help for those of us who still want to believe but aren't sure what's left to believe anymore. Does that, does that ring a bell? And then one more. Somebody said to me recently, we keep articulating the new paradigm in relation to the old paradigm and we keep referring to the Bible to justify going to the new paradigm away from the old paradigm Will we ever get to go straight from the Bible to the new paradigm? Does that, does that make sense? You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host. Our topic is on transformational festivals. In this segment, we will be talking about their new age influence, mystical influence on our church, culture, and worldview. Uh, why We've been talking about the risks, the spiritual risks that people have attending these transformational festivals. So why put your family at risk? Instead of participating in one of these Hindu, mystical, new age festivals, why not spend your vacation visiting sites? and Sound Theaters located in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and in Branson, Missouri, USA. Whether you live near or far from Sight and Sound Theaters, your time travel is well worth seeing the Bible come alive on professional stage. The show is impressive for all ages, and personally, our family attends every year. Moses is playing right now, and the musical is fantastic. Also located seven miles west of Cincinnati, Ohio Airport is Creation Museum. It's another amazing place to visit. Your family will love it and learn more about creation. So why not make a better choice for your vacation? Next spring and next summer, book your vacation around Creation Museum. Uh, Again, you're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We're talking about transformational festivals. With me is expert on the subject, Carl Tycrib. And uh, Carl, we've been talking about now the spirituality um, in these festivals, but now uh, we've just listened to an excerpt on these pastors or a pastor that was very excited uh, that there would be hundreds of them attending the Green Belt and Wild Goose uh, festivals. These are called so-called Christian festivals, Um, but these festivals still have a lot to do with deception. Do you agree with that? Well, yes. Yeah, so what's interesting is these, these festivals are really giving the same worldview, mm-hmm. but just through a, a veneer of Christianity, a veneer of, of Christian-sounding language, mm-hmm. uh, and, and with, with the uh, 
uh, involvement of Christian leaders, church leaders, uh, and trendsetters within Christianity. Mm-hmm. And, and so there are two, two uh, particular events that are geared towards a Christian idea of transformation. And one, of course, was the one that you just played the clip from. The other one is a Wild Goose Festival, which takes place uh, in, in the, uh, I believe it's in North Carolina. Um, it's, it's along the, the eastern seaboard, but I believe it's North Carolina. Uh, and what's interesting with these festivals is that while so much of it started off in terms of, of the music and, and the, the fellowship and the connections, people coming together to celebrate, they've, they've incorporated a worldview of experience. Your reality is based upon that experience. Your, re- your reality comes from, from looking at transforming the way that you look at, at Scripture, the way that you look at your community, the way you even look at yourself. Mm. It doesn't maybe go quite as far as some of the other transformational festivals go, but it goes along that same road. In fact, what's interesting is is Wild Goose, the Wild Goose Festival. Uh, people who attend and who have been some of the speakers include people like Phyllis Tickle, mm. uh, Brian McLaren. It is really a celebration of emergent spirituality. I don't even want to call it emergent Christianity, because... Right. What we're talking about here is this, the, the mythization, the, the, I hate to use the terminology, but it's true, the occultization mm-hmm. of Christianity, where our experience now frames our new reality, uh, where, where we, we bend ourselves to fit what the world wants us to look like, and so that we can begin again to start holding hands with the world, because that's what ends up happening. Cindy, I've gone to so many mm-hmm. major interfaith events uh, I've, be, I've been to, to United Nations events that have an interfaith context, and over and over again I see as Christian leaders end up holding hands, Christian organizations, uh, sometimes very conservative ones even, but as long as the intent, the intent is good, we are willing to hold hands, as long as it's for things like social justice. Mm-hmm. It's always good intentions, and in this case, Good intentions really are a pathway to hell or a road to hell, as, as the cliche often goes, um, because the good intentions are not necessarily grounded in what is true or what is real, but this illusionary concept of, of we are now all coming together as one. What's fascinating is that there is only one text, only one ancient document that speaks into today, projects into tomorrow, only one of all of human history. It's an anomaly mm. in terms of human history, only one text that says reality is not one, it is two. God, distinct, transcendent, exalted above nature, above creation, above the universe, mm-hmm. beyond the created order. We can't control them or manipulate them. And then the rest of the world, the rest of creation underneath. So literally God above and the rest of the created order within its own reality. And yet God sees fit to, to and wanting to have a uh, 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 a connection with us, a relationship with us, his created beings. That is the Bible. The Bible is the only text that says that reality is comprised of two, God, distinct, separate, transcendent, and then the rest of creation. All of the pagan worldview, all of it, ends up boiling down to it's all one. We're all part of the one. And emergent Christianity, emergent spirituality, speaks the same language of oneism, it speaks the same language of the New Age. It has Christian terminology, but it has the same flavoring, the same concepts, the same, realistically, the same worldview when you start boiling it right down to what this is all about. And then you realize that, oh, it's just New Age Christianese. And so that's what we're seeing with now Christians looking to mirror what the world is already doing. And the world is mirroring what society is doing. So, hmm. <laughs> There is the paradigm that we're seeing happening, and it's coming in the churches, and it is already part of the churches. It already is exactly part of the churches. On one of the clips, we heard the voice of Brian McLaren uh, telling a story, agreeing with someone, saying, we want to believe, but what's left to believe anymore? And he talked right. about the old paradigm to the new paradigm to the Bible. When will we ever get to go from the new paradigm to the Bible? In other words, let's leave the old thought out. And like you were saying, uh, that uh, the old thought, the ancient thought, is, is not even a thought anymore, if you know what I mean. And we're going to a new right. way of thinking, which is the oneness. Um, you know, at Greenbelt, Brian McLaren, uh, we know, some of you know who he is. I think years ago, he was voted on Time Magazine as one of the most um, popular 
evangelicals in the United States. So this man has a very huge, huge influence on our, our Christian community. He wrote the book Love Wins. And uh, basically, oh, that was Rob Bell. I'm sorry. It was Rob Bell that, uh, that uh, was part of that as well. But Basically, it's over true doctrine. They're, they're trying to get us to a place where there is no heaven and hell. There is no, no God above us. You know, we are one. And almost to the point where they're saying that we are little gods. And that's where it seems that it's going. Well, you know, in, in Brian McLaren's book, Everything Must Change, he goes mm-hmm. into, into quite elaborate detail about how, how salvation really, a, a big part of our salvation needs to be a type of collective salvation. Mm-hmm. And that includes things like the working towards social justice. Uh, com, com, and he, he used one individual's name, uh, Jim Garrison, who most people will never recognize outside of, of, of circles that deal with Mikhail Gorbachev, communism and the New Age. Jim Garrison was very much a part of that world, still is. Um, saying that we need to follow Jim Garrison's model of creating a community of communities. In other words, a political form of world order, a political unity of sorts. So we're looking at salvation being perpetrated through the works of our hands. That's what it boils mm-hmm. down to for the Christian side. We say that salvation now can be attained, but we will work for it, which is really no different than mysticism, paganism, which says... We will do it through our rituals, through the experience of interconnection, through interdependence, all that goes with, with, with this. What's, what's fascinating with this discussion, Cindy, is a few years ago, 2009, my wife and I attended a conference with Phyllis Tickle, another leading person in the emergent Christian movement. And she expressed when, there, when, when that new reality for Christianity would come about, and that is when we would finally reject Christians our, our Christian mm. doctrinal basis of Scripture. And she celebrated the, the time that will come when the Bible is no longer considered to be the, that final authority, that final standard. Instead, it will be part of just simply an evolving new spirituality. And we sat and we listened to all this, and we just we, we hung our heads. We couldn't believe what we were hearing, and especially seeing how many pastors and leaders, even from conservative churches, were sitting in the audience nodding, going, yeah, yeah, just soaking this stuff up. And we're like, okay, we're following the world. We it's are. no different. And you know, in we're Matthew, just now... I'm sorry, Carl, but in Matthew, oh, we're going to okay. be going on a break, but I just want to wrap this up. In Matthew 24, one of the signs of the Lord's coming, um, he goes on to say there'll be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes in various pla- places. But he says, take heed that no man deceive you. And that's what's happening. We're being deceived. There is a false unity. We'll talk about that real quick, that oneness that's going on. And uh, we'll, we'll revisit that after the break. So hold on. We'll be right back. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back. So please stay tuned. Our guest today is Carl Tycrib, founder, author, editor of Forcing Change. For more information, log on to www.forcingchange.org. That's www.forcingchange.org. Carl Tycrib is with us, chief editor of Forcing Change. Carl, we need to wrap this up. We have about two minutes, and we really need another show on this because uh, it is just... I think we need to get this message out there. But basically what it comes down to is that there is a false unity. It is not the unity that Jesus talks about in John 17 when he says to the Father, all that are thine are mine, and that I pray that they would be one even as you and I are one. The oneness that we're going to find in the church is one in Christ. All of his ordinances, his commandments, everything that the word of God tells us, that's where we find our oneness. We're not going to find it in community. We're not going to find it in connecting. We're not going to find it in believing that we are little gods ourselves. Um, Carl, I would like to point people towards your ministry. I mean, you have helped me so much uh, in this. I would like you, just real quickly, how can somebody get in touch with you? The best thing to do, Cindy, is go to forcingchange.org. Uh, we have a monthly publication that comes out. The, the next issue is just on the edge of being, being released. Uh, people who sign in, it's $4.50 a month. Sign in. You will get the latest issue, but then you also have access to eight years of back issues, over 1,500 pages of essays, articles, special reports, 
on areas such as transformational festivals, evolutionary culture, even the political side of what we're talking about in terms of global unity and the idea of world order. All of this plays into it because it all speaks of the same thing, mankind saying collectively, we are one and we are one in our own power. We want to thank you so much for listening to Love for the Truth Radio and we're looking forward to you coming back to the program. Thank you. 